Hi everyone, welcome to today's Beach Talk. We're in Matthew 28, where I wanna help us understand every word of God that's in the word of God in this chapter of the Bible. My objective is always the same, it's disciples making disciples who plant churches that plant churches so the grassroots movement of Jesus can continue all over the world, wherever God wants it to go. Now, our vision this year is to multiply from four ocean waters in two countries to eight ocean waters in four countries. Now, it's a big vision, so we need you to pray with us, and we want our vision to be big because God is big. It's not about us, it's about Him and what He wants to do in and through us all over the world. So Matthew 28 says, Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to draw, uh, began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb, and behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like the lightning and his clothes were as white as the snow. So now Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. They came to finish the preparation of Jesus's body, which was cut short by the Sabbath. So after the Sabbath on Sunday, the first day of the week, they came to the tomb fully expecting to find the dead body of Jesus. Now Matthew alone notes this earthquake. The earthquake did not cause the stone to be rolled away. If anything, the angelic rolling of the stone prompted the earthquake. So some think this was not a normal earthquake, but refers to the disturbance of the guards at the tomb. Whatever was happening, it was significant. An angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. When the women came to the tomb, they saw the stone rolled away and the angel sitting on the stone and the door to the tomb was wide open. Now, we pick it up in verse 4. It says, And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He was not here, for he is risen. And he said, Come, see the place where the Lord lays his head. Now, the Roman soldiers responsible for guarding the tomb were terrified. The angelic presence made these professional soldiers tremble and faint. Now, for the first time, the followers of Jesus, these faithful women, heard what they did not expect to hear. They heard that Jesus was not in the tomb, but had risen to, risen to life. Now, we should also say that Jesus still is risen. He ascended into heaven and he continues to reign as a resurrected man, still fully man and fully God. Yeah. He reminded these women and all the disciples that they should have expected this. It was just as Jesus promised. Now the stone was not rolled away to let Jesus out. John tells us that Jesus in his resurrection body could pass through material barriers. It was rolled away so that others could see in and be persuaded that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. Now, the fact of the resurrection is clear enough. We must grapple with the meaning of the resurrection. Simply, Jesus' resurrection proved that his death was an actual propitiation for sin and that the Father had accepted it. Now, the cross was the payment. The resurrection was the receipt, proving that the payment was fully accepted by God. Now, these women were later grateful that the angel told them to see the place where they had laid him. It would have, it should have been enough to merely hear the testimony of the angel, but nevertheless, when they saw it, it gave them ground to stand on, even more solid than the testimony of an angel. Now, when we see the place where they laid him, we see that the Father did not forsake Jesus. When we see the place where they laid him, we see that death has been conquered. And when we see the place where they laid Jesus, we see that we have a living friend in Jesus Christ. Now, look at verse 7. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out and quickly from the tomb, they uh, with fear and great joy, they ran to bring his disciples this word. So the angel commanded them to be the first messengers of the good news of Jesus' resurrection, since these women were some of the most courageous enough 
to publicly identify themselves with Jesus, it would be an appropriate honor for them to be the first ones to This assured that women, they would see the resurrected Jesus, that he wasn't simply raised from the dead, he was raised to continue his relationship with them. So the angel might have said, he is risen and he has ascended to heaven. That would have been better than knowing that he was dead, but the truth was far better. He had risen from the dead and risen to have and to continue his relationship with his disciples and with you and I. Now, when they ran to bring his disciples word, the women were filled with fear and great joy. They did exactly what the angel told them to do. He had told them to go quickly and they did it. Now we pick it up in verse nine and <clears throat> As they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice! So they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. <clears throat> go and tell you, my brethren, to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. So the women met Jesus as they obeyed the command to tell the news of the resurrection. This is exactly how it is in our life. Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice! Now, what could Jesus say to these women? What else could they do other than rejoice? Now, hail represents the normal Greek greeting and almost uh, a sort of hello in contrast with the fearsome appearance of being before an angel. Now, when the women met Jesus, they felt compelled to worship him. An hour, an hour before, they thought everything was lost because they thought Jesus was dead. Now, everything was gained because Jesus was alive. Now, notably... <clears throat> Jesus received the worship of these ladies. If Jesus were not God, it would have been terribly sinful to, for him to receive this worship. But being God, it was good and appropriate for him to receive it. Now it says, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee and there they will see me. Jesus told the women to do the same thing that the angel told them to do. So this is the first time Jesus called his disciples by this endearing name. They no doubt thought that the Lord would rebuke them or for their cowardice and their infidelity, but in speaking, he gives them assurance in the most tender terms that it was had all been passed over and buried forever. Now we pick it up in verse 11. Now that while they were going, behold, some of the guard <clears throat> came into the city and reported to the chief priests all the things that had happened when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers saying, tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. So they took the money and did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. So this cover up attempt, this fake news, shows the darkness of the priests. They knew the truth of the resurrection, yet they rejected that truth. The cover-up also shows their foolishness. It was as if the true, get, the true that the guards were asleep, they could not know that it was disciples who stole the body of Jesus. So you can see the lies already. To believe this, we'd have to believe a lot of things. We'd have to believe that all of the soldiers were asleep. Really, all of them? We'd have to believe that all the soldiers violated the strict law of the Roman military against sleeping on watch, punishable by death. We would also <clears throat> have to believe that the, that the soldiers slept so deeply that none of them were awakened by the work and exertion and noise necessary to roll away the stone and carry out the body. Now, all the soldiers were so soundly asleep, yet they knew who it was who did this. So, one commentator rightly said, here is a whole heap of absurdities. So, throughout the years, there have been many objections suggested to the resurrection of Jesus. Some say he didn't die at all, but he just swooned, or he fainted on the cross and spontaneously um, revived in the tomb. Others say that he really died, but his body was stolen. <clears throat> Some people say that his followers just hallucinated <clears throat> his, his resurrection. <clears throat> but the reality is, is that the resurrection, the resurrection happened. Now, he lives because the historical evidence demands that we believe in the resurrection of Jesus. If we can't believe anything in history, we can believe the reliable, confirmed testimony of these eyewitnesses. Jesus rose from the dead. 
Now look at verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went away to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted, just like we do. Matthew doesn't tell us about the Jerusalem appearances of Jesus to his disciples as John does. Matthew was more interested in showing that the promise of Jesus was fulfilled. So when they saw him, they worshipped him. This was not their first meeting with the risen Jesus, but it was an important one. At this meeting, they received their apostolic commission. Now, the natural reaction to encountering Jesus' worship, even if some had to overcome uncertainty or hesitation, probably from feeling as if it was too good to be true, there might have been a lingering shame of having forsaken Jesus shortly before this. So you see, when they recognized him, it was natural that they worshipped him. But the whole experience was probably so mysterious and overwhelming that some doubted. The verb distazo does not denote a settled unbelief, but a state of uncertainty and hesitation. Almost like a, is this real? Now Matthew's mention of this doubt as was a genuine historical echo. Those who were there would never have forgotten the, the conflicting emotions and beliefs in such a unique situation. Now the fact that some of the disciples doubted argues against the theory that their seeing Jesus was simply a hallucination or a desperate desire to see him. Now in verse 18, we see the Great Commission. It says, And Jesus came to spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Now, The commission that follows is given in light of the authority of Jesus. This indicates that this was an authoritative command, not a suggestion. It is the same idea as if an officer reminded a private of his rank before he gave the order because he has this authority. He can send whoever whoever he wills to do whatever he pleases. Now all, the word all dominates and ties these verses together. All authority, all nations, all things, all days. Charles Spurgeon said, we believe in his power and we rest in it. Now we do not seek any other power. We defy every other power and we know our powerlessness will not hinder the progress of the kingdom of God. We give all our power unto Jesus. Now go therefore, because Jesus has this authority, we are therefore commanded to go It is his authority that sends us, his authority that guides us, his authority that empowers us. His work and message would continue to the world through his disciples, through you and I. Now these verses are, they magnificently conclude this final section, but they also had to bring the whole gospel to a conclusion, which is in fact more of a beginning rather than an end. Jesus said, go to some very imperfect people. Now, who, who is he talking about here? He's talking about Peter, who had denied Jesus and cut off a man's ear. He talked about John, who tried to call down fire from heaven to destroy men. He talking about Philip, who wasn't with Jesus very long. Talk about Thomas, who said, I wouldn't believe unless they put my finger in your hand. We're dealing with an incredibly unqualified, squirrely group of people. Now, this command to make disciples not merely converts or supporters of a cause. The idea behind the word disciples is of learners and students of Jesus. Now, make disciples reminds us that disciples are made. They're not spontaneously created. They are the product of a process involving other believers. The making of disciples is the power of spreading the grassroots movement of Jesus. Now, Jesus deliberately restricted his work to Jewish people, he previously sent his disciples to the, with the same restriction. Only in rare exceptions did Jesus minister amongst the Gentiles. Now, all of that is in the past, and the disciples are commissioned to take the gospel to all the nations, all the ethnos, all the people's groups, every space and every place for Jesus. That is where we're supposed to go make disciples. D.A. Carson said, The aim of Jesus' disciples, therefore, is to make disciples of all men everywhere without distinction. 
Now Jesus commands them to go and baptize the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Significantly, when Jesus told them to go to all the nations, he did not tell them <clears throat> to do any other act except to baptize those who became disciples. Instead, this suggested a break with traditional Judaism. Now, in the name literally means into the name, implying an entrance or an allegiance to Jesus. Now, the word and context certainly indicate that it is disciples who were baptized, those of age who can be taught and who can observe the things that Jesus commanded. Now, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, the experience of God in these three persons is the essential basis of discipleship. Now, at the same time, the singular noun name underlines the unity of three persons. Now, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, disciples are made through teaching. This teaching is not with words only, but with power and always the presence of Jesus. He will be present with his people until the job of making disciples is done, until the end of the age. Now, the content of the teaching must be all the things that I've commanded you. The followers of Jesus are responsible to present the whole counsel of God in the Bible to those who were made disciples. That's why I teach one chapter at a time. And he said, and I am with you always, even to the end of the age, Jesus sent his disciples with a mission to fulfill, but he did not send them alone. The promise of his constant presence was more than enough to guide and strengthen us and the disciples as long as they obeyed Jesus in making disciples of all nations. Now the promise of his presence is complete. The verb always renders an expression found in the New Testament only here strictly it means the whole of every day not just the horizon in view but each day as we live it his presence means a privilege because we work with a great king now Paul understood this principle first Corinthians where he wrote we are God's fellow workers since Jesus promised I am with you always then we work together with him in service we certainly work for Jesus but more than that we work with Jesus. His presence means protection because we are never out of his sight or his supervision. His presence means power because we will fulfill the great command if we work in his name. His presence means peace because it always reminds us that the church belongs to Jesus and it is his church and his work. How then can we worry? And a church is just at least two or three people that are gathered in his name. God loves to start with small things and to make them grow. And the church is the same way. It just starts with two or three people. Now, this wraps up our time in Matthew 28 today. This concludes our look at this and wraps up our time in the entire book of Matthew. Now, what was God saying to you today? Let's talk to God about that. That's called praying. Maybe you need to hit reset in your life or get a fresh start, or you need God to do something new in your life. It is Easter. It's a beautiful time to pray for God to do something new in your life and in your heart. And if you want to do that now, just say, God, help me change. Come into my life. Do something new. And if you sincerely pray that, God is doing that right now. And I pray in all things that God will bless you this week as you try to follow him uh, in Jesus name and lastly today the Bible teaches us to give as part of our worship the followers of Jesus the disciples of Jesus have been practicing radical generosity and giving since the beginning of the church so I want you to pray about how God wants you to be radical and be generous and be abundantly giving towards whatever God wants to do and I want you to close your eyes right now and pray about that whatever God puts on your heart you can go to our website oceanwater.com you can click on giving and you can give there or you can uh, do it on Venmo we're at OCNWTR and you'll see our logo there and you can do it that way as well and uh, do this because we have plans this year to expand and we want to be ready to meet all the needs that are going to occur along the way so thank you so much and have a beautiful day